All right, yeah. higher order functions in C++. Um, I wanted to do this talk for quite some time, but um, it never happened uh, until now. Uh, the reason I want to do this is because I think C++ developers don't use higher order functions as much as they probably should. And with they, I mean you. Um, this will make sense soon. So, what do we mean with higher order functions? This definition can be taken from everywhere, but I copied and pasted it from uh, the Haskell documentation. So it should have some uh, homeopathic memory of extra truthiness to it. <laughs> so a higher order function is a function that takes other functions as arguments or returns functions as a result. Uh, have you used higher order functions? Have you written? Who has written a higher order function? Okay. Who has not written but used higher order functions? Not even a standard library algorithm? Come on. Some. All right? So I guess, I guess then that the rest of you have never in your life seen or used a higher order function. Is that correct? Okay. You're shy. Um, so let's go with this. We'll take some silly little example. Here we have a higher order function. We have any of from the standard library. So we take a pair of iterators and a predicate, which in this case is a lambda. So any of is a higher order function. It takes a function, the lambda, as its parameter, and it does something with it. You understand what, what this means? So in this range, it applies a call to this lambda um, and it breaks if it returns true at some point. So we can find if any value in this range is zero. So we can write this for those of you who have never written a higher order function before. Uh, a function template taking an iterator and a predicate. We don't care what the predicate is. It's just a, a type. We iterate. We call the predicate. It, by now, it really better be a function of some kind, or we get a horrendous compilation error. Return true if it returns true. Otherwise, we continue until we've exhausted the range and return false. So this is trivial. So. There's no, re no reason for anyone to write this because it's already in the standard library, but it's a simple example that's worth showing in, for those of you who haven't seen them at all before. So we go on with some other function, count if. So we count the number of occurrences of this number in the range. Cool, this is easy to understand. I'm annoyed as hell with this. This is bad code. This lambda, two lambdas, they are very near the same. What can we do about this? Can we avoid this repetition? What's the standard way to avoid repeating the same thing again? Well, we'll make a function. C++14 gave us the auto return type. And that is a great thing, because now we can just write a function that returns a lambda. A lambda is difficult otherwise, because you cannot express its type. But auto takes care of it for us. So now I have a function that has a name, equals. It means something when you read it. And returns this lambda that you can call with values, and it tells if it equals the captured value. So that is cool. We can, of course, generalize it a bit so that it works on any type, not just integers. And we can go completely bonkers. But uh, yeah, if you write a, a big template library, this is more or less the way you should do it. You should also add some uh, no except and uh, const expert. But I'm, I actually won't go into this. Uh, level of detail in the rest of the presentation. I just wanted you to see how 
crazy it can be if you really want to fall into that rabbit hole. But for the most case, it's simple. Just take something by value, store it as a capture in your Lambda and return it and you're done. Works almost always. So now we can rewrite this code and say, if any of the values equals zero or any other values equals this variable num. This code speaks to us uh, at a higher level. We can see what does this mean? What, what, what are we counting? What are we searching for? I don't have to read the lambda to try to make sense of it. So that is good. Or is it? I don't see Matt Godbolt in the room, so I guess we have to make do with his uh, Compiler Explorer instead. All right. Maybe this is a bit extreme with the font size. OK, so you recognize this code. It feels similar. And the generated assembly language. I'm using Clang here because it produces code that is easier for me to read. Uh, I, I haven't benchmarked and compared if GCC is faster or slower, but Clang is easier to read. So what we can see here is we obviously get the uh, iterators here. Check on line four if they are the same. If so, we'll leave. Otherwise, Compare with the value, uh, RAX is obviously uh, the value that we got from, uh, that, that we were searching for, uh, I here. If it's equal, we're done, we return true. If it's not equal, uh, add four, because that's the size of an integer. Uh, and keep going unless we reach the end of the, end of the range and then we return. Zero, return false. Um, I'd be hard pressed to write a more efficient implementation. So I would argue that this didn't cost anything, uh, except there are maybe I should. Do I dare to do this? If I call the standard any of instead. Ooh. Can you see what happened? Any ideas? Pardon? It's professional. It's professional, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, it has done a partial loop and roll. It compares uh, four values per revolution in the loop. Uh, so it's presumably faster, at least if the range is, is a large one. Uh, but it's definitely not easier to read. That's why I used my own. All right. Questions about that? Or didn't make sense? Or was it just completely weird? So how, how high did you have to go on the optimization level to get that? Uh, that example was with uh, dash 03. Um, we can check. We can check with something else. Okay, O2. <laughs> so now we know that. All right. Thanks, Matt. Question? Yes? If you optimize, optimize precisely, Should I do that now? Yeah, let's, let's try. Same. Right, so we've seen that at least for a, a quite simple example, uh, using a higher order function did not make matters worse, but it made the code a little bit uh, more expressive, explaining on a higher level what you, what you want to do. Okay, um, 
my job is in the uh, embedded world. I write software for uh, networking equipment, so obviously I need to do IP stuff. So we have a completely unrealistic implementation of an IP address here. The only reason I use it is because I want to have a known type, not just an int. And it's convenient in the examples to be able to create one from four values because it's, it's just easier to read. And then I have a net mask that is pretty much the same and I want to be able to use a, a bitwise AND between an address and a mask to get another address. All right. This should be, shouldn't be very difficult, I think. So now we can write a higher order function that checks if an IP address matches another IP address and a mask. So we use, uh, again, the this, this standard pattern, a function that returns a lambda. Uh, in this case, I capture the address given already uh, masked uh, and keep the mask. So that this one tells if, when, when called with an IP address, it tells, did the match. Clear? So, again, we can write code that expresses at a somewhat high level what, what we want to achieve. We want to remove all IP addresses. Okay, mistake there, sorry. Uh, vector of IP address, obviously. Uh, remove all addresses that, that match the 192, 168 subnet. Nothing weird. Let's go on, write an IP interface. An IP interface has a simple state that is an off or on. We want to be able to enable them or disable them. Query their address, query their, their mask, query their gateway. But now, if I want to be able to use that function that I showed earlier where we want to check if an IP address matches. How do I do that? I have an IP address here, an IP address, is, an IP interface here. An IP interface is not an IP address. So how do I search for an IP interface that matches a certain uh, IP address and net mask? Uh, well, we can see it this way. Uh, we want to do functional composition. So if I have a function f1 that takes a y and returns a z, and I have another function f2 that takes a, an x and returns a y, then I could compose them to a composition that takes an x and returns a z by going, calling f2 with x, which gets a y, pass that y into f1, which gives a z. So for example, f1 can then be IP matches and F2 can be an address of something that queries the address of an IP interface. And here's a, an admittedly quite naive implementation of Compose, but it's not very difficult to understand, is it? We have Compose of two functions, F1 and F2, and it returns a lambda capturing F1 and F2. It accepts something, to be called with something and returns the result of calling f1 of f2 of x. So again, if, if f2 is something that gets the IP address of an IP interface and f1 is IP matches, then compose IP matches comma address of is something that takes an IP interface and returns a boolean. Cool. So we can write code like this. Uh, studmem function is something that just, in this case, it takes IP IF, the, the pointer to the member function address. Um, I'm not very happy about doing this that way. Uh, I think I prefer to give it a named function. So in this case, something that takes an IP 
interface and returns the address. The reason for this is that if I, for whatever reason, want to change how I represent my addresses and IP interfaces, I have one place to change it in the address of function, not spread out with a plethora of calls to std memfun. Or we could be a bit crazy, I guess, and say that address of is something that takes whatever and calls address on it if it has it. To be honest, I'm very undecided of what I prefer. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, I'm sticking with the uh, address of function, the, the yellow highlight uh, for the rest of this presentation, but now you'll see in the alternative. So, we can then take this composition and again give it a name. Write a function that takes an IP address and a net mask, give it the name address matches that returns this composition. So that is cool. So now my find if is perhaps a little bit easier to read. Uh, we can discuss the name address matches. I'm not super happy about it, but it's decent. So we can add some more, uh, get gateway of and state of. Those make sense. And I think you're beginning to see a pattern here now. So why not add some more? When all? We want to check if both the address matches and the state is off. That makes sense. How do we do that? Well, in this case, I'm using C++ 17 fold expression because I'm lazy. There is absolutely nothing in here that cannot be done quite easily in C++ 14. But C++ 17 fold expressions makes it a bit easier. So in this case, when all is called with two predicates, address matches and state if state is. So this expression ps, x, and then dot, dot, dot is expanded into address matches x and state is x. So you get the normal uh, logic short circuiting as, as soon as one of them, the, the first that returns false breaks it. So you don't need to check anything more. So we have the address matches, you saw that one before, and state is is the same a function that takes something we want to capture with we return the composition. Cool. So then we can go completely bonkers and say that we want to enable all interfaces that match something certain. So why not do that? If then, okay, you know the pattern, right? I'm just repeating myself, it's the same, the same, the same. This, by the way, is the number one take home message from this presentation. Use auto return type to return lambdas. If you don't remember anything else from this presentation, remember that one, because it's really powerful. So if then takes a predicate and an action, calls the predicate with the value, and in this case I've been a bit insane, uh, and uh, don't, I do forwarding, perfect forwarding to the action because it may consume it the predicate should definitely not consume it. And set state is something that just calls a member function, set state. No mat, still. Okay, equals as before, IP address, you've seen it, net mask, any of, match IP, the IP interface, address of, that this naive compose, set state, address matches, blah, blah. So, to the end, we come to this loop for each 
if then when all etc etc and what do we get well this function is bigger so it needs to save the state on the stack we get our begin and end see if we're at the end of the loop if we are we're done we don't need to do anything more check get, get the address and compare it get the ip address compare it with uh, the address and mask uh, if it doesn't match continue with the next item if it does match compare the state if it's zero uh, then we get a one and call set state otherwise we continue do you see any bloat I don't I think this is pretty cool that you can write something on, on this high level and it doesn't actually cost anything in the generated code so what we have here is then on the left hand side we have some completely generic uh, stuff that really are library things like equals compose if then when all when none when any do all and some other stuff and then we have on the right the stuff that belongs to the application domain the ip addresses and how to match them how to get the gateway how to address matches for match addresses of uh, ip interfaces and query the state of them and such I felt extremely stupid on uh, Christmas Day, actually, when I had more or less completed this uh, presentation. And it dawned on me that the ones on the left are completely generic library stuff. So I started searching for libraries that does this, because obviously there are some, or so I thought. I didn't find any. I presume that I'm just not very good at web searching. It really should exist. If not, I decided to write one. So it's hereby announced. Feel free to use it. This one goes a little bit more insane than what I have told here. So it's completely const expert. It's completely uh, SVNI friendly. It's completely uh, no except does the right thing always. Uh, and it also allows functions with uh, any number of parameters. And it's composed is completely insane. Don't read it. Um, I think it's quite nice. Being that it is uh, completely const expert, uh, roughly half of the unit tests are just static asserts. So, takeaway message. Like I said earlier, write functions that uses auto return type to return lambdas. That is the number one thing. If you don't remember anything else, remember that one. It's powerful. It's really powerful. Write functions. You, you have obviously now watched during the uh, break this uh, talk that Jean mentioned with Klaus Eagleberger about free your functions. Now you see why. So use free functions. They make a lot of sense. And compose functions. And give the give the compositions names that means something in a higher level context. And that was all I wanted to say. Questions? You're all completely stunned. Jean? What if you cannot use auto? What, what would you use instead? You, if you cannot use auto, you get a more modern compiler, yeah. It's possible, but you don't want to go there. Please, trust me, you don't want to go there. Some kind of function. Uh, no, what you need to... Yeah, you could use std function, uh, but uh, I'm not convinced it's a good idea. Rather, what I would do is uh, I would have a... My higher level function would return a, a class template that contains the, the capture, and it implements its logic in the function call. So you, instead of using a lambda at all, you, you use a named class. But it, it makes your code a lot more horrible. But it does the same thing. Yes? Do you have any other... Okay, so, so you have to like and dislike using operator overloading or internal 
do I like or dislike using oper operator overloading? I, you're, you're aiming for Haskell style uh, operators, I presume. Um, I haven't actually looked into operator overloading in, in this. I don't have an opinion. Other questions? Gustav? How, okay, have, have I considered stood future? Um, the very short and very correct answer is no, I haven't considered them. Um, the, the, yeah, yeah I, can, I, I can see where you're, where you're coming from. Yes, I, I think stood, stood future could be useful here, but um, I haven't done any work on it. But um, hey, it's an open source library. <laughs> yes? Um, can you elaborate what do you mean with... The algorithm library was kind of curious to many in the past. Yeah. Here we have actually a good example of using that. Yeah. Do you think that's great for each code for example, it would be easier in some cases? Or do you think that using the algorithm is more modern? Um, I definitely, in, in general, I always prefer to use a standard algorithm over using my own handwritten loops. There are exceptions, but there are few. Uh, but I also am extremely much looking forward to the ranges TS, uh, where we can get rid of the begins to end to a large extent. Uh, was that a, an answer to your question? Uh, yeah. Also, I think that this is one thing. Uh, the standard algorithms were, to a large extent, at least those that were working, on, that are higher order functions, were pretty useless before C++11 because you really need lambdas for them. And now with C++14 where we can use auto return time and auto return type, we get much more expressiveness. So they are so much more accessible now than they used to be, even though the algorithms themselves were good. Other questions? Okay, thank you.